Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. My guest is Mark Biltz, and he has revelation like few people have ever seen. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you lived 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, and there was the hottest show in town, the best play in the world, and you could go into the dress rehearsal of this play, but this play has a spectacular theme. The theme is the coming of the Messiah. And you would see in the dress rehearsal every aspect of the Messiah coming to planet Earth. You would not have been among the Jewish people that missed the Messiah had you seen that dress rehearsal. Well, my guest, Mark Biltz, says there is a built-in dress rehearsal of the first coming of the Messiah, but there is also a built-in dress rehearsal of the return of the Messiah in the Bible itself. Mark, you were telling me about in the book of Leviticus, there is a, a section that tells us about these dress rehearsals, and you know what? Maybe there wouldn't be so, many conf so much confusion in Islam and Judaism and Christianity if we could get into this dress rehearsal and see about the return of the Messiah. Oh, exactly right, Sid. I can't help but think at a wedding you have a dress rehearsal beforehand and you want to be at the dress rehearsal. Well, in uh, Leviticus 23, uh, it says, these are the feasts of the Lord. He said, uh, these are holy convocations. They're, these are even my feasts. So I think it's interesting that the, the Lord says they're His feasts. It doesn't say the Jewish feasts or the Feast of Israel, but the Feast of the Lord. And the thing that's so amazing to me is when you understand in the Hebrew what the word feast and holy convocation means. Explain that. Yes, uh, when we hear the word feast, we think of food. But uh, the Hebrew word is moed, and it literally means an appointment, a divine appointment. Uh, and the word convocation uh, is like an assembly. But in Hebrew, the word is mikra, and it implies a dress rehearsal. And so we see all the feasts of the Lord were dress rehearsals, where they were rehearsing what was going to take place 1,500 years later prophetically on the spring feasts, and then the fall feasts concerned his second coming. And, you know, it's so specific on the first coming of the Messiah, and it's all in the feasts, or as in the Hebrew it says, these are set appointments that God has in which God says, I am going to show up. So tell me some of the, for the first coming of the Messiah, in the, and, and you call them God's feasts. I usually call them Jewish feasts, but they're sure. both. But they're really, even on higher, it's God's feasts. Tell me some of the signs. Well, one of the most fascinating things to realize, uh, first off, they had uh, the evening sacrifice, the morning sacrifice. They were at like nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. And uh, at nine in the morning is when they would offer up the Passover lamb. Well, in Mark, it says that Yeshua, Jesus, was bound to the cross the third hour of the day. So the very moment that the high priest was binding the Passover lamb to the altar as the dress rehearsal, they're binding Yeshua to the cross. And then at three in the afternoon, at the very moment the high priest is slaying the Passover lamb, that's when Messiah died. And what's amazing, uh, God had even planned the songs that were going to be sung at his son's funeral uh, because they would always sing during Passover what's called the Hallel, which is Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. So uh, at nine in the morning, here all throughout Jerusalem, through all the hills, the valleys, the Mount of Olives, Josephus said there were two and a half million Jews in Jerusalem at that time. You could just hear the, the chorus outside and everyone is singing Psalms 118 which is bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. You know, in Psalms 118, it says, this is the day the Lord has made. And there was more in that rehearsal because at Pesach, at Passover, we read Psalm 118. And part of that says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Could you picture knowing all of this ahead of time? Yeah, at the Mount of Olives, uh, well, it says they had sang a hymn you know, at the Last Supper. Well, I can tell you the words to that hymn. It was Psalms 118. And so what were the very words they were singing right before he was betrayed and rejected? But what you said, the stone the builders have rejected has become the chief stone of the corner. 
Well, is it just as precise in the fall feast as the spring feast as far as the return of Messiah? Oh, I think so. I think everyone uh, realizes that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if, if we really believe that, if He fulfilled the spring feast to the day of His first coming, He'll fulfill the fall feast to the day of a second coming. We don't set dates at all. Well, what I'm wondering is how did something that started out exclusively Jewish, so Jewish, so biblical, become the opposite of Judaism? How'd that happen? Well, uh, I think uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, a lot of the early church fathers wanted nothing to do with the Jews or Judaism. And so they, they, they didn't think they were grafted in, but almost like a separate tree. Uh, but God has the Gentiles. He wanted them grafted in so they would understand the, the richness and the fatness of the olive tree and, and get to the root. And, but, but why? I believe it's a satanic, diabolical plot oh, sure. to stop people from understanding every, from going to the dress rehearsal of yeah. the return of the Messiah. Oh, oh I think so too. I, I, uh, the book of Ruth, uh, Pentecost, uh, one of the spring feasts, they always read uh, the book of Ruth, which is about a Gentile being grafted in to this Jewish family, going back to Jerusalem, working the, the harvest, and bringing forth the Messiah is Ruth. Well, Ruth in Hebrew means friend. And so she befriended the Jew, but Orpah means to turn your back on. And so she turned her back on and went back to her gods, which I think is symbolic of these last days of uh, the Gentile church. But the, the Lord, the, Satan does not want the Gentiles to understand divine appointments. So it says in Daniel, the Antichrist is gonna change the times and the laws. He doesn't want us to know, so we're not there for the appointments. Well, these divine appointments are not something that someone has to attend. But my mother didn't raise a dummy. Who would <laughs> not want to be at a divine appointment, right. which God says He promises to show up at? I want to find out in detail about this divine appointment of the return of the Messiah that's built into God's feast. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this word. We'll be right back to it's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Mark Biltz, and we found out the most amazing thing. How would you have liked to have gone into a dress rehearsal of the first coming of the Messiah? Well, the biblical feasts are so precise. I mean, the exact moment the Messiah died was was written into the feast. In fact, you were telling me two and a half million Jewish people came to Jerusalem with, what, 250,000 lambs sacrificed on Passover? That's a lot of blood. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you, even if a lamb had a quart of blood, you're looking at 55 to 60,000 gallons. That's like a thousand 55 gallon drums of blood. Where's all that blood go? The priest would have been swimming in blood. Well, they would splash all the blood at the base of the altar. And uh, they had these like uh, aqueducts under the Temple Mount and the temple faced east. And so all the blood would go right downhill to the Valley of Blood, mm -hmm. the Hinnom Valley. And they had these giant cisterns filled with water, thousands of gallons of water. And they would release that water and the blood would be flowing, this massive river of blood and water is flowing down the right side of the Temple Mount into the Valley of Blood. So when you think about that, the Father's in the Holy of Holies. The Son, Yeshua, is on the cross. And so at the same moment, the blood and water was flowing from the Son's side. A river of blood and water was gushing from the Father's right side into the Valley of Blood. And then they have... Coincidentally, the side <laughs> happens to be the right side. The right side. I mean, side. every detail so precise. Yeah. And then in Judaism, if you remember when uh, Jacob thought Joseph had died, he rent his garment from top to bottom. And the symbolic uh, aspect of that is it's showing a broken heart. And it's called Kerea, K-E-R-I-A-H in Judaism. So what happens? The blood and water is flowing from the father's right side. The veil is his garment. And he rent his garment from top to bottom, showing his broken heart over the death of his son. And you know what else is so amazing is to point out, in fact, as a matter of fact, the DVDs that you're making available in the workbook, 
Uh, what kind of feedback are you getting on this? The, the feedback is incredible. We are selling uh, thousands and thousands and thousands uh, to people uh, all over the world, every nation. Because it's so simple, yet so profound. Speaking about something profound, on Yom Kippur, uh, there is something in the Talmud. Uh, what, what happened 40 years before the destruction of the temple, explain that. Yeah, I think it's amazing. In, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and the Talmud records that 40 years prior, which puts it at 30 AD, right when Messiah died, uh, what they would always do is tie a, a red crimson thread to the temple doors. Uh, and then on Yom Kippur, the scapegoat that was taken out in the wilderness, they would tie a red sash around one of its uh, horns. And uh, then when they got out to this edge of this cliff, they didn't want their sins returning. So they would take the goat and they would throw it over the cliff so it would die. And uh, what would happen, the, the crimson thread on the temple doors would miraculously, supernaturally turn white. And that's how they knew their sins were forgiven. But it's recorded in the Talmud that Ever since 30 AD, it stopped turning white. And then the, the temple menorah uh, inside the holy place, the middle candle is called the Western candle. And it was commanded in uh, Leviticus that the candle was never to go out. It had to burn continually. And the Talmud records that all of a sudden that westernmost candle would, went out and it would never stay lit. And then the other thing is there were these massive doors. These doors in the temple were 75 feet high, monster, 25 feet wide. It took 25 men to open these doors. And they said also in the Talmud that those doors would just naturally open up by themselves. So this begs the question, all these supernatural signs occurred 40 years before the temple was destroyed. Temple destroyed in 70 AD, 40 years fast uh, reversed goes to, to 30, the year 30, uh, what did we miss on that year that caused all these supernatural signs to show that God was displeased with us? And we're going right back to Yeshua as the Messiah. Oh yeah, definitely. All, all the signs pointed to Him. Uh, in, in Genesis 1.14, God said He was going to give us signs. Okay, speaking of signs, uh, when, when we come back, I want you to talk about these strange signs in the sky that indicate something major is about ready to happen. But just as the spring feasts speak of the first coming of the Messiah, the fall feasts speak of His return. Tell me a bit about what insight we have on His return. Well, sure. Uh, the, the, fall, the spring feasts were fulfilled in order. And so the fall feasts will be fulfilled in order as well. Not necessarily the same year could be. But uh, the first fall feast is the Feast of Trumpets. Well, I think people that have read the book of Revelation are familiar with trumpets. And uh, then after the Feast of Trumpets, which I think signal the beginning of the tribulation, some year on that day, I don't set dates. Uh, after that comes the Feast of Yom Kippur. Uh, that's Israel's Day of Atonement. I believe some year on that day, the veil will be removed and Israel as a nation will recognize Yeshua as their Messiah. And then comes the Feast of Tabernacles, where He will tabernacle among men for that thousand year reign of peace. Do you believe that as we get more and more insight into God's feasts, we will be able to literally know the details of the return of the Messiah? I, I mean, think so. How strongly do you believe that? I, I believe that very strongly. Uh, in Daniel, it talks about in these last days, knowledge will be increased. And I think that's just not scientific knowledge, but biblical knowledge. I think God is going to be removing the veil in Isaiah. God says there's a veil over all nations. Something is coming very soon because Mark has some revelation on things going on in the sky that show a major event is about ready to happen. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this word. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural! We now return to It's Supernatural! Hello, I said Roth here with Mark Biltz. And Mark, you had a revelation last night that is, I'm still staggered by it. Explain. Sure. As I was uh, dreaming last night, uh, all of a sudden I woke up and the revelation hit me as far as what's happened to the Word of God. Uh, I kind of think of it as a, some, a prune or let, let's say it's something that's been dehydrated. All the water has been taken out of it. Uh, that's how people sometimes view the Torah or the Word of God. Uh, many people, they, it needs to be hydrated. You need to have the, Yeshua is the river of life. 
the living water. And I think what has happened, a lot of people have taken the living water out of the word and uh, we need to rehydrate it. And when it's hydrated, you find out the most amazing things. Speaking of uh, hydrated with the Spirit of God, the Messiah said there would be strange signs in the atmosphere, in the sky, and you found out something amazing. Yes, what's, what's amazing to me is Yeshua said there would be signs in the heavens. Uh, the sun would turn dark, uh, the, the moon would turn to blood or red, uh, and, I, and it quotes that in Joel as well. And so I thought, well, this sounds like a, a total eclipse of the moon, a total eclipse of the sun. And so uh, I went to NASA's website. Uh, because God is so mathematical, uh, when He created the sun and the moon and the stars, uh, they can project all the eclipses, thousands of years backwards and thousands of years forward. And in uh, Genesis 1.14, God said He created the sun and the moon for signs. Well, in Hebrew, the word there is oath, and it means signals. So the main purpose of the sun and the moon was that God wanted to send us signals. And then it says for seasons. Well, we think winter, spring, summer, fall, sure. but the Hebrew word is moed, the same word translated as festival. So the sun and the moon God created as signals on his feast days for signs of his appearing. And then it says it's for days and years. So I went to NASA's website and I uh, looked and lo and behold, there are four total eclipses of the moon back to back in 2014 and 2015. NASA calls it a tetrad where there's no partial eclipses in the middle. And when I looked at it, I looked at it on our normal calendar and I didn't notice anything. And then I thought, well, I have to look at the biblical calendar. So I switched mm -hmm. the dates to the biblical calendar and behold, in 2014 on Passover, the first day of Passover is when we have a total eclipse of the moon. The next one is on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then again in 2015, there's a total eclipse of the moon on Passover again, and then again on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now looking back in the past, when there have been these total eclipses on these set appointments from God, these biblical feasts, uh, there have been some amazing, significant prophetic things that have happened. Yes, uh, these tetrads or these four moons, total uh, eclipses of them, happen rarely, but last century they happened twice. 1967 and 1968 when Jerusalem was recaptured on Passover and Tabernacles, Passover and Tabernacles, and then again right after Israel became a nation in 1948, it happened in 1949 and 1950. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is tied to Israel. Uh, and so I looked in the 1800s, there weren't any. 1700s, there weren't any. 1600s, there weren't any. In the 1500s, there were like four or five times, but none of them fell on the feast days. And then uh, in the uh, 1492 is when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain. Uh, and in 1493 and 1494, the same thing. And so I thought, wow, 2014 and 2015 looks like it's to be pretty significant. All right, we know it's going to be significant just based on what you said. A little sanctified speculation. What might happen? Might. I know we can't predict, but no. might. Yeah, I don't predict anything, but I, I think this is a sign uh, that will happen during the tribulation at some period of the seven year tribulation. I don't know if it's in the beginning, the middle, the end, but I think uh, that God is trying to signal uh, his people that uh, there's something significant that will be happening in 2014 and 2015. And the reason for that too is I thought, well, what about the solar eclipse? Because he also said the sun would turn dark. So I went and I looked at NASA's website, correlated it to the biblical holidays. Mm -hmm. It so happens Nisan 1, let's say roughly April 1st, uh, God told Moses to change the calendar to begin in the fall, to begin in the spring for the religious calendar. And it so happens on Nisan 1 is when Moses set up the tabernacle, okay? Uh, there's a total solar or eclipse of the sun, the total eclipse of the sun on the first day of the religious calendar. And then two weeks later on Passover, the total lunar eclipse. Then there's another solar eclipse on the Feast of Trumpets, followed by another total lunar or eclipse of the moon on Tabernacles in 2015. What feast is the Messiah going to return? I think his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. There's, uh, people mean different things by return. But in Zechariah 14, it says his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. It'll split in two. 
And then three times in Zechariah 14, it talks about how everyone from all the world, all the nations have to come to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which has to do with uh, Yeshua tabernacling among men for the thousand year reign. So I believe his feet will land on the Mount of Olives uh, on Yom Kippur. And then five days later, you have the Feast of Tabernacles. He'll begin his millennial reign. Uh, you know, what doesn't make sense to me is the first church was all Jewish, observed all of God's feasts. And then there was an interim period where the feast stopped. Then in the millennium, as you just mentioned, Zechariah says, we'll, we'll start resuming the Feast of Tabernacles. Isaiah talks about the Sabbath. All yes. these things are going to be renewed. Now, we know the feasts have nothing to do with uh, our relationship with God, the cleansing of our sin, the atonement of our sin, our righteousness. We, there's nothing to do with that, but it has a lot to do with understanding the times and seasons that we're living in. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, we'll be sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that feast. And uh, like you said, it's not a salvational thing. But I tell you what, how many people want to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb? If you want to be there, it'd be good to be at the dress rehearsals uh, to know what's expected. Well, speaking of dress rehearsals, do you know that you can have a dress rehearsal for heaven? You really can. You can experience heaven while you're still on earth. You can experience the kingdom of heaven, the rule of heaven. You don't have to put up with all the nonsense that life has to offer. You can have an encounter with God for yourself. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about terminology like being born again or saved or uh, any of these things that are turnoffs to most people, but there is just something that's not a turnoff, and that's having intimacy with God for yourself. Now, whatever your religion, do you have intimacy with God? I'm not talking about knowing and believing in Him. I'm talking about intimacy with Him. Yes. I'm talking about hearing His voice. I'm talking about walking in divine peace. I'm talking about fulfilling destiny. There is only one way to know God, and that's the Passover lamb has been slain. His name, Yeshua in Hebrew, Jesus in English, and all that blood that flowed washed away every one of your sins. And although you think you're a pretty good person, God says all of your righteousness is as an unclean woman in His sight, because compared to His holiness, you're unrighteous. So you need His blood. You need the blood to wash away your sins. Tell Him this. Say, I believe the blood of Jesus washes away my sins, and I'm clean. And now that I'm clean, Jesus live inside of me. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's it.